welcome to Peak Health with Dr. Gupta. This show is for those who want to optimize their health, maximize their genetic potential, and have some fun along the way. Gut health is something that's so important and pivotal to our well-being, but is so often overlooked by many. Our intestines are not just a dumping ground for calories, but an exquisite, intricate system that provides information to our body and mind. If we keep our gut healthy, it has a reverberating effect on our entire body. In fact, our gut is composed of trillions of microorganisms, about 100 trillion approximately. That's about 10 times the amount of human cells we have. And there are 20 million microbial genes versus 20,000 human genes. So really what we're taking care of is not our gut, but the good bacteria that reside within our gut. And the question is, how do we do that? To answer this question today, once again, we have Dr. Andy Wong. Andy is a good friend of mine, founder and director of Capital Integrative Health. He graduated from Tufts School of Medicine, completed his internal medicine residency at Georgetown University Hospital, and is board certified in internal medicine, integrative and holistic medicine, and has advanced training in acupuncture, functional and integrative medicine. Welcome, Andy. Thank you so much, Ravi, for uh, having me come on again today. I feel like a, a veteran now on your show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is, this is our second podcast we're doing together. Happy to have you. The first one was amazing. I'm sure this one will be equally so. Let's go ahead and just get started with a simple question. Why is gut health so important? Well, the first, thank you, Roger. The first the reason why it's so important, I think, is 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 the most important reason, which is that, you know, um, we love food, right? I, I love food. I, I'm sure you love food. I'm not sure what your favorite foods are, but you know, everyone, everyone listening to this probably, I, I don't know anyone that that doesn't like to eat. <laughs> There are and, people and out there. There are there are people out there. Well, and and I think I think for for people out there with you know eating disorders and body disorders, I, I should say that we're talking about gut health today, not not in the setting of of weight loss or you know something like that, but it's really more in the setting of how to have a healthy microbiome and a healthy gut. There's a a, a famous physician from from the ancient Greek times named Hippocrates, and and you and I. Ravi, as medical doctors, when we first started, you know, we have this white coat ceremony and we take something called the Hippocratic Oath. And, and, um, and, and you know, it's basically to do no harm and to try to serve to the highest good and everything. And this idea of Hippocrates, who's a very, you know, in, in the Western, you know, medical tradition of, you know, he's like the gold standard of, you know, medicine. And that's who we look up to. And that's the oath is based off of, you know, Hippocrates. He actually said something very holistic back in the day, back in the ancient Greek times. He said basically that the gut is the gateway to both health and disease, right? And we know in functional medicine, this kind of root cause medicine, that it's sort of the same where we're, we think we're, we're, you know, actually it's it, functional medicine in some ways is not really, um, uh, it, it's not really inventing the wheel, it's reinventing the wheel, right? It's actually just like something that's already been said 2000 years ago, which is basically that the gut is at the epicenter of, of of health, and 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 that makes a lot of sense. You know, why is gut health so important? Why why should you know someone listening out there care about gut health? Of course, we know it's important to eat food and eat healthy food and stuff. But why is it so important? Well, number one is the gut is the main interface between the outside of the body, you know, the air you breathe, and you know everything going on in your in your external environment. And the internal environment in terms of your organs, your tissues, your cells, your bloodstream. So this idea is the gut is really the main gatekeeper between the outside and the inside of your body. So if you think about a, a kind of a border, like a, a cell border, like a, a gut border, you want that cell border to be really intact. You want that cell border to get nutrients in the body that you want to get in, things like vitamins and nutrients and you know, good foods that that are fully digested so that your cells can take up that energy so that you can live your life in a very full, productive, and optimal manner to have peak health, right? As you say in podcasts. So what does that mean for this patient, you know, or, or a person that doesn't have, that doesn't have peak health, that doesn't have a good gut lining, what's going to happen in that situation is they might get symptoms like they might get loose stool or hard stool, like sort of like constipation, diarrhea. They might start having undigested food in their stool. They might have gas and bloating. They might have reflux. They might even have abdominal pain and different things. So you should definitely see a practitioner to check these things out to make sure it's nothing else, you know, serious. I think we should just say that, like, you know, you can have people that have abdominal pain, blood in their stool, and and sometimes you have to 
think about making sure it's not colon cancer. You have to get a colonoscopy. You should see a GI doctor. So, you know, when do you, when do you go to see a doc? When can you try to do things more on your own? I think you can talk to your medical providers about that since this is not a, you know, medical treatment podcast here. But I would just say in general, why gut health is so important is because it is the gateway between the outside and inside your body. And as a result, it really does, I think, dictate and control a lot of systemic overall health. Um, when the gut is healthy and happy, the body is healthy and happy. In other words, um, we can take uh, someone's gut and if we see someone have a good gut lining and they're digesting right, then A, they're going to get the nutrients in that they, that they want, but also B, the toxins and the bacteria that, that shouldn't get across the gut lining to the bloodstream won't do that with the intact gut lining. So I, I think that uh, in a way, um, this gut lining is really important for overall health. A healthy gut lining is going to lead to you know, uh, it's going to lead to basically overall balance in the body. There's going to be, uh, you know, we're going to avoid things like chronic disease, you know, things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, autoimmunity. On the other hand, if there's a gut lining issue and toxins get across there and excess bacteria or fungi get across there up into the bloodstream, what's going to happen is the immune system gets revved up, right? This red alarm system called the immune system gets revved up. And then our bodies have these kind of chronic ongoing inflammation that then leads to chronic disease or chronic illness. So this is what, this is why the gut is so important is because it's not just about the gut. It's not just about gut symptoms, but it's really about systemic health. The gut is the gateway to the entire system. Absolutely. And, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, a quote that you often hear is food is medicine, right? And it truly is, you know, the food you eat contains different information there are different signals that the body takes in based on what you eat. And if you're eating unhealthy food, the lining of your gut is going to suffer. The bacteria that I mentioned earlier is going to, the good bacteria is going to decrease in population. The bad bacteria is going to increase in population. And it's going to cause a whole host of various issues. Around 60% of your immune system is in your gut. So as Andy was mentioning, when you have a leaky gut, um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. You could have proteins and other types of things, of bacteria, fungi going into those spaces, and your body could have an inflammatory reaction. And it could manifest in multiple ways. It may not just be, you know, something that manifests after you eat, but it could manifest have some some you know odd symptoms, fatigue, generalized feeling unwell, maybe some rashes, whatever it may be. It could happen a couple of days later. So um, getting into this more. Um, Andy, what is, what is leaky gut? What is dysbiosis? Can you explain those? those yeah, things? sure. Sure, Ravi. So thanks for leaky gut. So, so the gut has a single cell, meaning a one cell deep lining, epithelial lining that is lining this basically hollow tube. So just if you're listening out there, imagine that your, your body has this gut tube that basically is this tube going straight from top to bottom. I mean, there's some twists and turns in there, of course, the intestines, but essentially it's a hollow tube. And that tube is, is, is filled with things. It's filled with food. It's filled with, you know, with different kinds of bacteria in there. Um, even, even some fungi and parasites sometimes and things like that. So there's a bunch of things in that tube and it stays in that lumen or it stays in that hollow pipe with which we call it the digestive tract or the gut. Um, now this single cell lining, now it's only one cell deep. So it's very easy, I think, to, to, um, to get what's called leaky. So the, the thing about the gut lining is it's, it's not really like a brick wall or something like that. It's not like solid that, you know, we think it's solid, but it's not really solid. It's more like a cheesecloth. And so the analogy I typically use with gut lining is it's actually more like a cheesecloth. So it's going to let certain particles in that are small things like digested food or, you know, nutrients or water or things like that are going to get in through that cheesecloth and grow to the bloodstream so, so that your body can be nourished with these nutrients. Now, there are certain situations where that cheesecloth gets a bit more holy, so to speak. So there's just bigger holes, the cheesecloth gets ripped a bit, you know, things like that. So from a scientific term, there's actually these what are called tight junctions that sort of control like a gatekeeper, they kind of open, they close, they open and close and they let stuff in, but then they keep stuff out. So there's these tight junctions. And what happens is if those tight junctions between that single cell epithelial lining is damaged, 
then that starts allowing these bigger particles like bacteria and allergens and toxins and undigested food in the body. And otherwise it would be kept out, but instead they kind of escape through that, through that lining to the bloodstream. Now, what happens is if these bacteria, viruses, um, undigested food particles that are not fully digested essentially get um, escaped to the bloodstream, uh, when, which you know they shouldn't have gotten there, right, essentially, and then the immune system starts to react to these things that cross through that lining. That could cause things like that you wouldn't think of in terms of gut symptoms. It could be things like as diverse as fatigue or, or joint pain or headaches. Um, it could be things like skin rashes, you know, think about about allergies and, and things like that, sort of what's called a mast cell reaction. So there's a lot of things that can happen when things cross over the, the barrier to the bloodstream, and they're usually related to immune system reactions. So from a leaky gut perspective, you know, this is actually a concept that was, you know, over 10 years ago, um, this was kind of brought up. And a lot of times, you know, even now, I think a lot of conventional docs are, are kind of like, well, this is not a real thing, but this has actually been published in um, journal articles, including in, in some of the main uh, main uh, GI journals like the Journal of Gastroenterology. So this is a proven concept and molecularly proven concept now of, of what's called leaky gut, kind of quote colloquially, but I think we could also call it an impaired intestinal barrier as well. Um, now, it's also important to know that there's a relationship between leaky gut and dysbiosis. So let's talk about what dysbiosis is. So dysbiosis just means that there's an imbalance in the in the flora, meaning in the bacteria, um, and, and the other organisms in the body and the gut, I mean, um, so we can, we can have different types of microbiomes. A microbiome is just these kind of living organisms, these tiny organisms like, uh, bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites that are living in community with each other. So we have things like a gut microbiome. We have even a microbiome in the sinus cavities and the bladder and the vagina, even in the eye. And recent studies even show that there's a microbiome in the brain. So really anywhere there's life, there's a microbiome. And, and dysbiosis, D-Y-S, biosis, it means there's an imbalance, right? Biome, biology means life. So dysbiosis means there's some living organism community that's sort of imbalanced. So there's an imbalance in the microbiome. Now, what does that mean? Let's, let's pretend that, you know, you as a listener, you know, own a hotel, right? Let's say you own a hotel and it's 30 stories. But, and on those stories are different tenants and those tenants are typically good. They pay their rent and they're, they're good and they're clean. They don't smoke that much and things like that. And they basically help you out and they keep everything, you know, nice and tidy. And they also, um, you know, communicate with each other and build a community. That's, that's kind of like what you want your microbiome, microbiome to be. So let's say you have people kind of coming in that are, you know, um, smoking a lot and maybe doing drugs and, you know, they're trashing the place and things like that. That's the kind of microbiome you don't want. So the idea is you want your gut field, so to speak, to contain more good bacteria than the inflammatory bacteria. So what happens is everyone has some degree of, you know, relatively quote unquote good bacteria and then relatively quote unquote bad bacteria. But I think those terms are somewhat simplistic. I would just say overall, there's just a lot of bacteria. We would say about over 30 trillion bacteria in the body, which is about as many human cells as, as we have human cells. So there's about 30 trillion bacteria in the body and then uh, 30 trillion human cells. So we can say there's about a one-to-one -one ratio. So if that, if that hotel in the body, that gut lining gets off and there's too many, you know, kind of bad actors in there that are just, you know, uh, smoking a lot, or I don't know why I'm using smoking right now, but you know, um, trashing the place, putting beer bottles all over the place, you know, then then that's not going to be good for that hotel. So you're, there are certain bacteria that are going to decrease inflammation. They're going to promote nutrient production. There's actually some nutrients that we actually get from these good bacteria, and and we can't get them anywhere else unless we take supplements. So some B vitamins, vitamin K, and things like that will will actually be produced by these bacteria. There's also a lot of other other issues other like organic acids like short chain fatty acids, which basically are are acids that also help to um, modulate the microbiome and help keep the gut lining healthy. Uh, but then if if there's an imbalance in that, that's what we call dysbiosis. And that's where you can get both an imbalance in the gut lining. So dysbiosis actually causes an imbalance in the gut lining. 
but then that's where you start getting these symptoms of of leaky gut things like bloating and and you know mixed uh irritable bowel syndrome with constipation diarrhea let's say um even things like reflux uh abdominal pain etc can't tolerate more foods so um i think that's a long-winded answer to say that there's a relationship between leaky gut and dysbiosis and usually one um accompanies the other and they're both they're both kind of you know hand in hand with each other um the, the one thing else i'll say about dysbiosis is that it's not necessarily always so much about removing bad bacteria but it's about repopulating the good bacteria because if there's a lot of you know tenants so to speak in your gut that are good then then that kind of crowds out the bad one so to speak so that's the idea of of having a balanced microbiome and there's different like natural ways and nutritional ways and lifestyle so ways to uh to to help with that yeah okay excellent we can talk a little bit about that later um thanks andy that was a wonderful overview of what those two what those two terms met, mean so would you suggest that people should always consider dysbiosis and leaky gut regardless of how they're feeling i mean is there a situation where you'd say hey look i am i have no gut issues i'm totally fine i shouldn't even worry about being tested for this if you if you lived in a Ravi, if you lived in a non-toxic world where there's no metal or pesticide pollution, ate organic all the time, didn't have any stress, got eight to nine hours of sleep a night. <laughs> um that, that's you how know, you live. And, right? and yes. Yeah. That, that's how that's how Dr. Wong lives. <laughs> I wish I lived that way. Yes. Uh we, we're all working on it, right? We're all working on it together. Um, so, so, so the, so the answer is, uh, that unfortunately our food supply is contaminated with pesticides, especially here in the U S we have glyphosate, which alone causes leaky gut. We have, you know, uh, we have organic fields that are contaminated with pesticides, even if they don't grow, you know, pest, you know, with, with pesticides, their, their neighbor field might, might, might get those pesticides blown over from the wind. Right. And things like that. Um, in, in addition to that, I mean, I don't know how many people, but I don't do that. How many people cook? every single meal, right? How many people shop and cook organic every single meal? No, I mean, I don't do that. I ideally, yeah, I mean, I feel better when I do that, but do I, do I have, can I do that? It's, I could, if I didn't do anything else in my life, probably. Um, so there, this idea of, of, you know, trying to be good, but can't be perfect. You know, that's kind of what we're, we're dealing with here, which is fine. The other issue is that, you know, there are, um, uh, a lot of microorganisms that are affected by stress and sleep. And we talked about sleep on on recent podcasts but it's interesting because sleep deprivation and also um also sleep timing affect the gut microbiome in other words if someone doesn't get enough sleep or they're sleeping at you know the wrong times or something like that that would actually impair the gut microbiome and actually increases some of these pathogenic or inflammatory gram negative bacteria when when that happens um same thing with stress if someone's eating a, a perfect diet and they're you know shopping at the organic store and cooking all the time and trying to avoid glyphosate but if they're stressed out that that stress that psychological stress is going to damage leaky gut as well or going to cause leaky gut i should say do you know, so these do you know are things that, that are not happens? well known because it's not only about the diet itself what's do you know you know uh, biochemically um how that happens what what happens with stress and how does that cause leaky gut now, stress increases cortisol, which is a stress hormone that helps us deal with stress. But in a chronic situation, that cortisol elevates, you know, even more. Um, what also happens is that with stress, there's an inflammatory molecule, which, which you know, Robbie called NF-kappa-beta. NF-kappa-beta is the primary mediator of chronic inflammation. And once NF-kappa-beta and some of these other molecules like C-reactive proteins start to get generated and propagated, then that inflammation alone damages the gut. So, so so physical stress, you know, like if someone was playing an NFL football game and got a concussion, that's that's a stress, right? That that those type of things cause leaky gut. But psychological stress through that mechanism of cortisol, NF kappa beta, and IL one, IL six, TNF alpha making CRP, C reactive protein is going to also cause leaky gut through that mess through that inflammation through that inflammatory pathway. The other thing is it it, it probably does it directly, but it also indirectly does that as well because stress also communicates with the microbiome. So the microbiome is getting these messages from the brain and you know from these what are called inflammatory chemical messages called cytokines that that's saying okay the body's under stress so it, it allows these kind of bad bacteria to kind of come out and play more so it's starting to to crowd out that. I guess one way to say it is if you had an alleyway that was all lit all the time 
and, and there were city lights on there and there was someone sweeping it all the time and, you know, keeping it clean, then, then, you know, the thieves wouldn't come out or something like that. But then if those lights started getting broken, right through physical or psychological stress, let's say, or other things like um, antibiotics would also cause leaky gut, then, then you can actually see where, you know, some of these bad actors might go into that alleyway if the lights were out and if they were broken and stuff, because there was an opportunity for them to do so. Right. Okay. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that analogy. That was very helpful to understand. So bottom line is most people should get tested if they're considering this. And I think it makes sense. You know, it's, it's a good idea to get tested at least once. I would, I would say, um, just to see where you are at baseline and what, is, what kind of testing do you do for this tech? Um, in our practice, we use primarily a, a DNA based stool test. And now some people might've had this from their, their GI doctor. This is a different company that looks, I think a little bit differently than, than one that's available often at GI doctor, but it'll look at things like opportunistic bacteria, meaning the ones that are going to get into the alleyway if it's dark, you know, that kind of thing. It'll look at parasites and viruses and then um, yeast like candida, which is a cause of a lot of issues as well. Um, and then it'll also look at some of the good bacteria. So it's not just about, like I said before, it's not just about um, eliminating or removing bad bacteria, but it's actually about increasing the good bacteria to keep the streets clean, to keep the gut clean, so to speak, um, to keep the body healthy and keep the gut tight junctions you know, intact. So there's no leaky gut to reduce inflammation. So I think we can talk about how, you know, bad bacteria can reduce, increase inflammation, but also on the flip side, the good or the good bacteria, the, the better bacteria will, will decrease inflammation and seal up those tight junctions, which is what you want. Um, and it also looks at these tool tests also look at markers for pancreatic enzyme production, things like elastase. It'll look at, um, something called steatocrit, which is measures basically how well the body is digesting um, fat, you know, through like a fecal fat measurement, essentially. It'll, it'll look at things like um, blood in the stool, but it'll look at immune system markers. There's actually a couple of really good immune system markers on there. Um, calprotectin, um, it'll also look at um, anti-gliadin antibodies. So that is a marker for gluten sensitivity. If someone has a anti-gliadin marker positive, then usually we would have them go to GI to make sure they don't have celiac or something like that. But also if, they're, if their immune system is reacting to gluten, we might try them on a gluten-free diet for at least 30, 45 days, something like that. And then lastly, it does test for zonulin, which is the protein that helps to control the gates opening in and out of those single cell epithelial lining. So that is a marker for intestinal permeability. If you have a high zonulin level, Z-O-N-U-L-I-N, then that is going to be a sign of, of leaky gut or intestinal permeability. So it's a very high level, I think, advanced stool test that is widely available now in the functional space. I do recommend that most people get that if they can afford it. It usually is not totally covered by insurance. Um, if people can't afford it, or if they kind of just want to start with with the nutrition lifestyle first, which is a very valid way to, you know, start things, then, then I think in a way we have to, based on our chronic, you know, stress and life and, you know, our food systems and things like that, we can say that, you know, most people probably, you know, if we had to bet, you know, probably do have some sort of impaired intestinal permeability slash leaky gut. And, and, you know, just start on a gut healing program and see if that helps them if they have symptoms. Of course, if they're not having symptoms, then it's sort of like, you know, maybe we don't do any of that and, and focus on other things. Okay. Excellent. So the, the, really, the test is a stool test, as you mentioned, that is the one test. Is it, are there blood tests? Um, I should mention oh. another functional test. So we do do a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth breath test. It's typically a lactulose breath test that measures both hydrogen and methane gases, which are produced in the small intestine by bacteria. If they're overgrowing in the small intestine, then they're going to show up on that test. Um, so we, we do that test sometimes if someone has upper GI symptoms like bloating or cramping or upper abdominal pain or alter, alternating diarrhea constipation or, or one or the other of those, then, then those are, um, I think indications to do what's called a SIBO test, S-I-B-O for a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Blood test wise, there are some more advanced tests that you can do. Um, there's actually tests for GI autoimmunity that can be done. Some people have what is called irritable bowel syndrome. Um, symptoms like I was mentioning before, after getting food poisoning, after going, maybe they traveled somewhere, maybe they went to a creek and drank some, 
you know, um, some water that wasn't filtered or something, they started getting these symptoms of bloating and gas and constipation food in their stool, um, in their stool and things like that. So we think about either parasites there or, or, or maybe, maybe a bacterial infection that then started to trigger autoimmunity of the gut. And so there are some blood tests like that. We can also do tests like food sensitivity tests that see it, is seeing if the immune system is reacting to things like, like gluten, which is the main protein in, in wheat or, or casein, which is the main protein in dairy and, and other, other foods like that too. Um, but typically we try to do that as a second line test because a lot of times if someone has leaky gut, if someone has gut dysbiosis and imbalance in the gut lining or in the gut microbiome, then, then a lot of times if we treat that, the food sensitivities will go away or be greatly improved with that, with that gut, with that primary gut treatment. Okay. Excellent. So we spoke about symptoms. We spoke about diagnoses. We spoke about pathophysiology and testing. And then what about treatment? How do you treat? Well, in a functional medicine approach, as you know, Ravi, there's, there's different ways to, you know, treat the gut. I think, um, we often talk about what's called a five R program, which is basically um, the first star is to remove any pathogenic bacteria or any foods that might be causing any allergies or sensitivities. So the first R is remove. Um, the second R is going to be replace, uh, replacing things like digestive enzymes um, or even stomach acid if needed. Some people are low in stomach acid. So that's, that's the replacement um, for step two. Step three is typically repopulate, repopulating the um, microbiome, uh, meaning the the gut microbiome with, with good bacteria, which can be done in different ways. Um, things like prebiotic foods, uh, mostly things that are high in polyphenols, certain fruits, certain vegetables, um, certain carbohydrates that have a uh, high amounts of soluble fiber. You think about whole grains there. I'm thinking about lentils and, and legumes and things like that. I- ideally organic. Okay. Um, but, but things that would improve the, um, the microbiome, uh, from a prebiotic perspective, which basically means it's going to nourish the probiotic good bacteria in the, in the body. There's also different probiotic foods and supplements that can be, um, used. So probiotic foods, um, the, the, the easy one we always think about is yogurt, which has some live bacteria in there. It typically has lactobacillus and, and, in, in there, but there's also some different types of supplement, you know, probiotics as well. I think overall, um, repopulation is one of the most important aspects, like I said before, of this five R program. And then the fourth uh, R is going to be to uh, repair the gut lining. So this is kind of like, you know, the the the, the brick house got destroyed. We're going to re rebuild it, you know, kind of thing um, from the ground up. So usually there we might be doing some things like, you know, food wise. You can think about bone broth, things that are very nourishing to the gut that have a lot of you know, collagen in it that has some glutamine. Uh, glutamine is one of the amino acids that the, 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 the small intestine needs to rebuild that gut lining. So you can take glutamine supplements, but uh, we also like bone broth as well. Uh, and then the fifth part, I think, is also very, very important, maybe the most important of them all, which is rebalancing the, the gut nervous system. So the gut actually has a nervous system just like the nervous system is running through, you know, all of our body, but, you know, three of the major organs are going to be the gut, the, um, the gut, the heart and the brain, all of these areas have neurons. They actually have quote unquote brain cells or neurons. So the gut has these neurons that are basically, um, communicating all the time with the brain and, you know, deciding whether or not that person is in a quote unquote fight or flight stress response, or if they're in a more chill out, you know, relaxation response. And typically for gut health, you want to be in a relaxation response. You want to be, you want to be um, relaxed and you want to be able to digest your food. So the way that I look at it is if you're running away from a tiger, you're not going to want to go eat your chicken sandwich or your veggie sandwich, right? You're, you just, you know, you're just going to be in this fight mode. No one's going to want to eat, right? So the problem is that, you know, in modern day life with, you know, um, different things that we're doing and running around and stuff, that, you know, probably 90% of the time we're in a fight or flight mode. So, so if we're trying to fit that eating in there, right, even that concept of like fitting in lunch, right, we don't prioritize those, you know, eating, eating slowly, chewing our food and things like that. So let's talk about rebalancing the nervous system. I think having some gratitude before meals, taking a breath, 
um, you know, just to kind of acknowledge that there, there's a meal that's happening, get your salivary juices started, and then chewing your food at least 20 chews per bite. I think that's easier said than done. I know it's hard for me to do that, you know, as a busy clinician, but um, I would say that's really helpful because digestion really starts in the mouth. And, and we, need, we need that digestion to start, you know, up top in the brain and the mouth before we get to the rest of the gut. And then things like yoga and meditation and things that are going to balance that nervous system so that you can rest and relax. And so you get away from that idea of running away from a tiger when you're eating. So you're really focusing on the present moment and focusing on the gut. And really, when you rebalance the system, there's a bunch of things that happen, which are really in- incredible, really, is that when you rebalance the nervous system, not only does the does the microbiome get better, meaning that the percentage of good bacteria actually gets higher when you, when you actually do that, when you do meditation, when you do these mind body practices, but also the physiologically too, the, the, the motility gets better, the enzyme uh, levels get better. So, so just through, through mind body practices alone, you can improve your gut, which I think is probably the easiest, but yet the hardest thing to do, because it's always something that, you know, none of us have time for, you know, sometimes, even though we, we, that's, that's when we need to make the time for it. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, it's, I love hearing this. This was a, a wonderful overview of the five R protocol. You know, another name for it I've heard is weeding, seeding and feeding, right? You're just, you're getting rid of the bad bugs, seeding the good ones. And then, and then, you know, oh, I like that. Going. It's, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting when you talk about these things, it reminds me of my mother and my grandmother and what they used to say about keeping healthy, like, Hey, just relax when you eat, you know, eat a bunch of, make sure your food has all different types of colors on it, which, you know, they're talking about the polyphenols, you know, relax after you eat, um, take deep breaths. You know, it's like these ancient wisdom techniques sort of all it's coming full circle and there's evidence behind these things. And you mentioned this in the beginning of the podcast and that this is not just, this is not reinventing the wheel, but we're going back to what was already done in the beginnings of recorded history and coming back to that. And that's, we re- we're realizing that's the healthy way to live and survive. Absolutely. In fact, you know, oftentimes lifestyle and chronic stress is how we got to have gut issues. And many times addressing that is also the way out of that, the way back to health. Absolutely. When you test somebody and say they, they are diagnosed with leaky gut, does your treatment change based on the different types of bacteria or whatnot they may have in their system? Or is it so, is the same type of treatment that you prescribe to repair that leaky gut? Yes. So there are certain differences. So for bacteria, if someone had Helicobacter pylori, which, which we, we both know is a, is a bacteria that mostly lives either in the stomach or, or the small intestine, but it can, in some situations, cause ulcers. It can be a risk factor for gastric cancer if there's virulence factors involved. So I would say for H. pylori, what we want to do, if we see that on the test, we do typically try to follow up with that. So we give them a treatment. It could be herbal treatment. It could be antibiotic treatment, um, but there's specific antibiotics, you know, regimen that's used for H. pylori, but we do like to see that go away. And we like to see that, that negative result in that post-test, you know, post-treatment test. I, I think if there's a parasite and, and there's, you know, things that are causing irritable bowel sy- uh, syndrome symptoms or, you know, things like bloating and gas things, then again, there, I, I do like to often check, you know, for both H. pylori and parasites, a recheck, you know, if there's other, other ones, other kind of sort of more run of the mill bacteria and things like that, we don't always have to check if someone's feeling better. Um, I, I think for the for the side of, you know, what do we start with? I think we usually start with herbals. They tend to be a little bit more gentle for the body. They tend to be a bit more broad spectrum, actually, in terms of treating, you know, both bacteria, parasites, and yeast. Whereas if we give antibiotics often, we're just going to be hitting, um, you know, bacteria only and not yeast and parasites. So um, unless it's something specific like H. pylori, then, you know, we'll start with something like that. Or there might be some certain parasites we'll give specific anti-parasite meds for. Um, but, but often we will give a general herbal protocol, but I think it's important to know, which said a couple of times here is that we have to follow that up, reinforce that remove treatment with the replace and repopulate. Otherwise it, it's sort of like, you know, it, it's like the alleyway, I guess I'll go back to the alleyway. Um, if we chase away the thieves from the alleyway, like the bad bacteria, right. But we don't restore the light bulbs and, and, you know, clean up the, the, the alley that then they're just going to come back. 
right? So, yeah. so, so that's why it's really all five of those. Our program is going to be helpful. Excellent. Okay. So basically, depending on the types of bacteria they have, you may tailor treatment to or bacteria, parasites, what, 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 you know, fungi, fungi. Um, you'll tailor treatment towards those specific pathogens, but otherwise it's sort of like a general approach. You mentioned herbal remedies. Um, what is there, can you give us some names or what kind of herbs do you use? There's a lot of different ones. Some of them are combo products. Some of them are, you know, um, uh, more, more single agents, but uh, definitely uh, berberine is a nice one. Um, uh, berberine and then oregano is nice. Um, and then wormwood is nice, especially for parasites. Um, and there's other ones too, but those are the ones that, that kind of come to mind. Uh, neem is actually, uh, something that can really help too. So there's, there's different things. Um, even garlic extract can be, um, can be one of the, one of the things in the protocol. So a lot of times we'll use a combo product, but if someone's really sensitive, we'll use single agents first. Excellent. Well, um, Andy, this was amazing. Just as the sleep uh, podcast was, this was equally informative and uh, interesting. Really appreciate all the the education that you offered here to uh, myself and our listeners. How can people get in touch with you or your clinic? Thanks, Robbie, for the opportunity. It's it's fun talking about all these things and you know really delving to the root causes of health to get to peak health. Um, so yes, uh, we are at Capital Integrative Health, which is a, a clinic here in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, DMV. Um, and you can reach us at www.cihealth.org. Um, we also, I, I didn't know if I mentioned this last time, but we have an Instagram that, that Jen is really amazing, our, our marketing director and stuff. So um, she's actually doing uh, the whole Instagram side of things. And uh, we have Facebook and things like that. But I think Instagram, we're pretty we're pretty active on. Wonderful. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much, Rob. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, please make sure to hit the subscribe and the like button and leave a comment about what you'd like to see on our future episodes. Just a reminder that this podcast is for educational purposes only, it does not substitute for professional care, nor does it constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you're looking for medical care, please seek a qualified doctor or medical professional. For more information, or if you'd like to check out our programs, please visit our website, peakwellnesshealth.com. That's peakwellnesshealth.com.